Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kat Mohammed, and I'm the Director of Education for AHOA. Welcome to Let's Talk Money, Financing Your Projects. I'm pleased to introduce today's moderator, Sabina Aurora. Sabina is a principal and founder of Acadia Lodging Brokers and Advisors, a full-service hotel brokerage and capital advisory group. Sabina has over 20 years of hospitality real estate experience. Our panelists today are Sagar Patel, Chief Investment Officer for The Witness Group, Suraj Patel, President of Sun Development and Management Corp., Chuck Prezakop, Member Attorney for Ruben, Ehrlich, and Buckley PC, and Dinesh Dan Rama, Principal and Managing Partner of New Gen Worldwide. Please give a warm Ahoa welcome to our speakers today. Let's jump right in and get started. Them. I think uh, uh, new purchases, uh, there is readily financial uh, finances available if you buy it at the right price, put the PIP factor inside of it. Um, but the new construction is getting tight, which is good in a way, it controls the new inventory that's coming in, keeps the rookies out from making those mistakes that we saw in 2008. Um, so, you know, I, I see it as a positive. But whatever project you're doing, and I'm going to agreement with him, if it's not shown already here in the next two quarters, uh, it's going to be tough. It's going to get tougher and tougher to uh, get this stuff financed. So you all say there is capital available. But who are these sources? And let's not talk SBA. We're talking who are the specific, is it the CMBS market, is it debt funds, is it insurance companies? Where can our constituents go? And how do they present themselves to these new Right. Well, look, you've got pension funds, there's private equity groups. Uh, I, I remember when we first started, my bought my first hotel, we had to call our uncles for money. And, you know, now it's changed a little bit. Now we do PPMs and uh, get really fancy with this stuff, um, uh, with waterfall features. So I, I, at the end of, uh, of all this, there's capital available. Ours comes from around the world because we are the EB-5 program. Um, but you have to have, remember, at the end of the day, you're selling an investment somebody has to buy into. So you have to have a good story, a good product, you have to have a good location, um, and then people would invest. But I think there's plenty of equity, there's plenty of capital out there. Um, as far as debt is concerned, you know, uh, the last couple of deals we did was with life insurance companies. And, uh, but they're very conservative lenders. Well, on that note, you said about uh, telling a story. Sagar, you and I had this conversation earlier that it's not it's important now to take what's on the envelope to the spreadsheet and make it very clean. It's not the simple spreadsheet now, it's got to be detailed. How have you changed uh, the witness group in terms of your project, changing the capital structure, and, um, presenting a story? Sure. So I think um, getting sophisticated with your packaging for the project. So like uh, Dan said, in terms of selling it, right? Selling the project, selling uh, what you're trying to build, whether it's a new development or an acquisition or whatever, maybe value add conversion. Um, packaging it up, so not just giving a performa in a star report, telling the, the, the demographics of the, the city that you're going into, what companies are around, creating a map, creating a, kind of a lender package, right? With a lot of, which a lot of brokers do for you if you hire them to go out to get financing. That's really helped us in terms of selling the project. Um, getting lease interest from a lot of different uh, sources of debt, um, and it shows that you're serious, right? Another thing that we've really looked into to help develop a project is adding some other components to the real estate. So, for example, we've done a couple of deals where we've added retail, and banks love retail, especially if you have good credit tenants that are going to be your tenants. Uh, 15 year leases, um, you know, security income is triple net, so all that money is coming to your bottom line. That allows you to get a little bit flexible on the equity needed for a loan. Um, and it also makes the land, if the land is really expensive, it, it enables the performer to work out. So I think that's one way that it works to really help uh, get financing from a lot of our regional lenders who are a little bit scared when it's a big hotel deal. This helps minimize their risk and also minimizes our risk as well. Uh, but I think packaging, like uh, Sabina said, in terms of you know creating that package, um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of brokers out there will give them to you. As, a, as an example, modeling off of that to say, you know, here's, a, here's my project, here's a performa, not just basic numbers, but also down to the NOI, showing your expected debt yield, your debt service coverage ratio, all that will really help 
convince a bank to say, hey, this is a good project. And then almost your history, right? If you're a good operator, you've got good, um, strong financials, all that you need to put into the story to say, hey, we're a good, we're a good, um, we're a good person to lend to. And just to add on that point, now when you mix up the asset with retail, your value engineering, that's what they love to call it on Wall Street, value engineering. So now you've got a retail at a six cap and your hotel at an eight or nine, 10, whatever it may be, and you're actually being able to build value and create a larger number in terms of LTV. Yeah, I, I really want to pick up on what you said about the story. Um, I think that I, gone are the days, and they'll never come back, no matter what anyone thinks, uh, of being able to just shoot out a performer on the star report and say, hey, finance me, and your lender that you always had will finance you. So I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. If you have to get a little more creative and push your uh, push the municipality to give you tax credits or develop, uh, developer-backed bonds, um, and maybe they'll never do it for a hotel directly, but you get creative and you find a way to have them fund roadways and improvements or public space or convention center or something. And all of a sudden your basis comes down, say on an embassy suites to look like a uh, Hampton Inn and Suites, then it becomes a much more valuable project. And you have municipal buy-in. The same thing applies to, to your franchise brands. Look, there's it, all these years have been uh, you know, begging brands to give you franchises, but the flip can also be said at this point. There's such stark, stark competition between uh, the three that most of us are in here uh, brand groups that you can you can squeeze a little bit of key money or something there. Whether it's a lot of money or not, it's symbolic, and it shows a lender that you've done the work to bring uh, a much safer risk-adjusted IRR in. Um, so both those things apply. You just have to get a little creative. There's also uh, a tendency for us as a community to want to own all our real estate, which I completely understand. We've never known anything different. But the vast majority of developers um, that do big office buildings, malls, everything else in this country uh, use uh, you know, GP equity and, and have limited partners and function on a promote structure, which means you don't have to put much or any of your own money in uh, to develop projects. Now that means you are giving away the you know twenty percent returns to somebody before you start taking returns yourself. But if you're a good developer, you can do a multitude of projects that way without having to put out any of your own money. Um, there's MES, there's specialty finance lenders. If for for uh, capex and FF and E, there's readily money available um, from specialty hospitality groups uh, like Access Point. I'm plugging them for the sponsorship, but um, but uh, but no, there's there's readily that money available as well. So I just think you you can either throw your hands up and say it's impossible to get construction financing done, or you roll up your sleeves and start figuring out a way to make your projects attractive, and then you find a banking relationship. Well, on that point, I noticed at Sun, you guys actually use the major brands such as Hilton and um, Sheridan now is Marriott, but you're doing brands outside of the typical norm of Hilton. You're doing a canopy, a tra cha uh, tapestry. I think you've got a handful of Cambria, which is not even, I don't think they're recognized yet as a brand because they have to have 40. So has that been an advantage in terms of, you said it has in terms of getting key money, but has that, how do you pitch these new brands to your lenders and how has that helped you? I, well, the good news is you're necessitated to use these new brands in markets that are probably already saturated with brands, and that's because the markets are already really good. So you're starting from somewhere where you can say, look, i got to build a tapestry here because everything else is already built. And that might be because, more than likely, because it's a really strong market. Um, most of your top 25 MSAs in, in downtown areas have all the brands. So now you're like, I have no choice but to build a tapestry. And at the same time, you're telling Hilton, well, I'll be one of the first people to do this, but obviously I need a ramp and some key money and whatever to help build your brand. So it's a, it's a two-sided coin here. Like you either have, uh, you know, a Hampton Inn somewhere, but look, they're probably already built in all the markets worth building Hampton Inn in. So think a little bit outside the box. With Choice, um, Choice balance sheet is so strong, it's such an aggressive development team that that, that if you're willing to do a Cambria somewhere, uh, they'll work with you. 
And then you can turn around and go to your lender and say, look, here's my IRR on five, seven years out when I've got a ramp and no one else does. And here's my tax abatement and here's my developer back bond. And I can actually go and trade that for 80 cents on the dollar up front and use that as my equity into this deal. And so again, if you want this to be simple, uh, you know, fill out your SBA loan package and go build a hotel, that's one thing. And that is a, that is a long time ago. Uh, but if you are willing to roll up your sleeves a little bit, I think you can actually end up with much better deals. It sharpens your focus so that you don't end up in a 2008, 2009 type situation. We're a little bit different up here because like, well, at least two of us, we came of age in, uh, in the worst of times in this industry. So we're way more risk averse. That's why I say right now, if you have the opportunity to take some money off the table, to refinance, to sell, private equity, whatever you can do right now to take these, sure, you might be the guy who misses one more year of, of, of um, uh, values going up, uh, but no one's gonna laugh at you if you're that guy. But if you miss it by a day on the other end, that sucks. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. So you've talked a lot about construction, but how about acquisition financing today? Considering um, the industry has had taken a hit, as you all said, between 08 and 10, and there's been such a bias, negative bias of our industry, considering the, the change in market segmentation, um, perception of certain geographic locations, aggressive PIPs requirements by all the brands. It's not just one. Um, lenders are getting picky about, you know, physical plant, stick versus brick versus, you know, uh, concrete. Um, how do you navigate past those issues? How do you, how do you be creative when you have all these roadblocks in your way? Is that a tough one for you guys? <laughs> yeah, coming from the lawyer, I don't know lawyer property, right? Uh, well, I guess my take on it is it's from a legal uh, standpoint. And, uh, I guess one thing first you have to be aware of is when, you, when you're buying the property, you've got to figure out how you're structuring as far as your organization goes, who your members are, um, are you bringing in a private uh, institutional type investor, are you well, friends and family, uh, but you have to think about how am I going to get out? Once I get in, uh, I run it for a few years, uh, do I have the ability to get out? Uh, do I have to go in and assume a loan? Uh, do I have to go in and uh, obtain new uh, financing? Uh, so when you're looking at your structure, uh, you want to make sure that you have the flexibility in both your operating agreement uh, to remove partners, to take them out, uh, and incorporate that into your loan documents going forward. Uh, lenders typically, if you're a, a local bank uh, uh, who's given the, given the financing on your project, uh, they're going to be very restrictive. They're, they're going to want you to come to them for anything because uh, they have a, typically they'll have a relationship with you, um, and they'll just tell you, look, if you're going to transfer an interest out, uh, come to me, talk to me about it, and, and we'll work it through. Whereas if you're in the CMBS market, or if you're in a non-recourse uh, uh, loan that the bank may be holding on its portfolio, you're probably going to have a longer term on that deal. Uh, so you're going to be locked in for a while. So I think you're going to, uh, typically in your CMBS products, you're going to have a uh, transfer provision that's going to permit minor transfers of 49% or less. Uh, but you may have more specific needs, whereas, uh, uh, institutional type investor that has come in with you as maybe a preferred equity holder, uh, he may want to get out in year five and you may have a more, uh, longer time horizon. So you're going to have to pre-negotiate that up front uh, with your lender. And uh, uh, these type of issues, uh, when you present it to the lender in connection with your acquisition financing, you have the most leverage at that time. You haven't sunk a lot of equity and due diligence costs in the project at this time. Uh, presumably at this point, the lender likes your project. Uh, uh, so that's the time to start raising these type of issues to with uh, transfers. I can add a little bit to that. I think uh, gone are the days where you can do a back of the napkin initial analysis and that's where you base your um, assessment of a pro you know, project or an acquisition. So doing a lot of thorough due diligence up front, I mean, 
we've been through a process of witness group where we always get an HVS study or a third party study to kind of look at the market, uh, what's coming in, how that's going to impact that hotel, um, get really detailed on our expectations for top line, chop off 5% just to be conservative and, and really get to a number that we're comfortable with so that when you bid, um, you're, you're comfortable with the NOI and, and what debt service coverage you're going to get. Um, that's really helpful when you go to lenders to tell the story like we've been talking about. Um, another thing is, like Chuck mentioned, matching the debt to your strategy in terms of hold. So if it's a longer term hold, there are a lot of life companies or, or permanent debt that is attractive right now. Um, and, and they're willing to give you good rates for long term money as long as your LTV is conservative. 65 to 70%. It's a little bit more equity goes a long way with these lenders. Um, but again, you're stuck. I mean, you can, there are provisions where you can get the debt assumed by someone else when you sell it, but um, you can't, the prepayment on that is really high. So I think that you know, matching that strategy is very important. Um, so I think due diligence up front for any acquisitions that you're bidding at the right rate, that you're comfortable with, that helps you pitch the story to the lender. And then on the back end, in terms of your strategy, if it's long term, this permanent debt CMDS is, is useful because they have good rates. Um, but you have to know that you're going to, you know, there's, you give up flexibility uh, in terms of retrading the debt. So that's just something to keep in mind. When it comes to acquisition, uh, when it comes to acquisition, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we've done is we even we go as far as all the due diligence he's talking about because I remember before it was counting cars. How many cars that for about five days, right? Now we go to the Planning and Zoning Commission, we go talk to the city, the new development, the, who the development uh, uh, manager is for that city, and we go talk about um, what's going on. And that's really uh, how we make our, uh, our decisions. Uh, and then obviously underwriting it on the spreadsheet. But I've seen a lot of buyers that just spreadsheet themselves out of a deal too. Right? They just create too many spreadsheets. And, you, and, and we all know you can't predict the future. Uh, just because what the historicals are doesn't mean that um, that's what's going to be in the future. But how are you all changing the perception? I know spreadsheet-wise, but how are you changing the perception of some of the lenders who have uh, steered away from the logic sector and convinced them that the returns, the, the revenue is going to return, and it's not just operational, but there is value. You know, everything that goes down must come up. How? That's, that, that's hard, right? Because institutions are governed uh, by uh, the government, and so they, they have to have a mixed asset classes uh, that they lend to. So, you know, there's a lot of banks out there that have actually probably maxed out uh, on the hospitality side. So convincing them, I'm not, I'm not sure. I would just think, why bother? Uh, why bother to try to convince a big lender that the asset class of hospitality is it's worth? It's not necessarily, it could be your regional lender. Can be, you know. Right, but what I'm saying is that there is readily, uh, there are readily lenders out there for this kind of uh, business. We know many of them, the large ones who they are, and then regionally, um, that's a tougher sell, not because of the asset class, it's because you're convincing them of the relationship and the story, which is why consortium lending is so hard to get. Um, but when it comes to acquisitions, I, I think it's infinitely easier to finance an acquisition and ongoing cash flow than it is to do new construction. That being said, how many people want to do an Yeah, of course everyone wants to do acquisitions and ongoing cash flow. I mean, that's why uh, there aren't that many good acquisitions out there. Um, but when you see larger pips like this uh, and up conversion opportunities or just conversion opportunities, you should look at it like, like an opportunity. Everyone in this room, this is our business. Right, if, when REITs and, and uh, public REITs or private REITs or anybody has to get rid of an asset because they can't do the PIP because that is um, the structure of a REIT, then you're the person that uh, isn't comfortable just distributing 90% of your profits and dividends every year. You're here for growth. That's why we're all here in this business. So for us, that's the best opportunity, right? To take something. The only thing I would caution is to make sure that you don't just acquire an asset without knowing where you're going to get the capital for the pit or assume you can do it ongoing because it never works. So capitalize the PIP expenditure when you buy the asset because you know that when you're doing a PIP, 
the disruption to your regular business is going to be massive no matter how many ways you try to cut it. Um, zero times has it ever worked that you can like ongoingly do a full pip and still keep your loyal customers coming and use the cash flow and doing all that. That's when you get in trouble. So as long as you capitalize the improvements and in your acquisition and have a roadmap for it, then I don't think there are better ways to add value or to convince somebody. And then after you do a few of those, that's when you can go build that relationship with the lender that says, okay, well, let's try a three-year mini prime on construction, something like that. Um, but the, I think that acquisitions, if you can find a good one, is a really, a much easier sell. In terms of the going back to the diversification of debt and changing your capital stack. Um, how do you see the preferred equity versus putting in your, getting in partners, doing the waterfall versus going out there and leveraging up to the max? Where do you see the optimal level, Sagar, specifically for you, as you begin to consolidate debt? As our members start to have, are going beyond the two to three to four properties, and now they're building value and can maximize in value engineering as a portfolio versus a one-off. Right. What if, how, any recommendations? So I think there's a two pieces of question. I think the equity piece, like sort of said, I mean, all of us want to own the real estate, right? We want to control the real estate as much as possible. But as you get into a growth period in your business where you're going to, you know, the next level of deal, 15, 20 million dollars, whatever it may be, um, you may need to get some equity help to be able to get the deal done. Now, what you can do is do preferred equity, uh, get those investors in, and then as you get the asset stabilized and to a value where you're, you're comfortable with, you can refinance and buy the investors out, as long as you have it written out in your term, whatever it may be. Uh, this is especially helpful for new developments, right? As you ramp it up and get to a value based on an NOI stabilized, it's going to be much higher than when you open the doors. So that's a way to help with the equity piece, to control the real estate long term if you wanted to. On the diversification of debt, um, as you grow a portfolio and you get two or three or four or five hotels, it's really important, I think, to look at your debt portfolio as a, as a portfolio. So. Something that we've really instituted is how do we shift debt from our regional banks for our stabilized assets over to large commercial lenders who are not going to touch construction lending, but are giving great rates, especially based on the swap rate, right? So these banks will they'll fix the rate based on the swap for five, seven, ten years, whatever term you want to you want to do. And the beauty is you you don't want to break the swap because it's a huge penalty, but you can swap in assets based on the value of the, of the debt. Uh, but that frees up your regional lenders who are really good based on your relationship, based on your history with them for construction lending. Uh, that's really helped us out when we're doing construction lending because we get great rates and we get two-year terms. Uh, so that's enough time to develop the project uh, and gives us comfort. So I think looking at debt that way in terms of how can you shift over things that you're out of prepayment for or you have a pretty good LTV on and you're not looking to cash out, you have cash on the sidelines that you're ready to invest in and in new construction, how do you shift that over and then free up the regional to help you with the construction. Actually, Charles, can you tack on as you now cross collateralize your portfolio, what are the pitfalls? Because again, five years down the road, you want to sell and pull out one of the assets, and now you're cross collateralized in the pool. How do you avoid these pitfalls? What are common, what are uncommon? What can you negotiate up front? Sure. Uh, so really what you talk about is in your, your exit strategy with your, your existing lender. So uh, if you're in the CMBS market or you're uh, a large regional lender uh, that may have it in its books, you're probably going to have some sort of uh, defeasance payment, prepayment, or yield maintenance prepayment penalty. Um, and if you're a local bank deal, it's probably very simple, you know, just a 5.321 prepayment uh, fee. It's, uh, straightforward, but uh, if you're dealing with yield maintenance or uh, defeasance costs, uh, defeasance uh, tends to be very difficult. Uh, it's uh, very intensive at the end as far as uh, there's a lot of hidden costs dealing with uh, uh, the due 
diligence costs the lender has to go through to actually purchase the securities, uh, to hire the accountant to uh, verify that there's a sufficient funds to uh, meet the ongoing payments that you have to make on your loan. Uh, just keep in mind that when you defease, the loan doesn't really go away. It's just that your borrower is going to release of the property, the loan still stays in existence, and the lender is taking this collateral uh, to service the, uh, the ongoing payments for the loan. So a couple of things on defeasance, you want to make sure when you negotiate up front uh, that you are only uh, paying defeasance collateral uh, through your open period. So when you have, uh, let's say you have a 10 year loan term, uh, you'll have an open period at the end that's usually three months that you can get without any uh, additional costs. Uh, you want to make sure that the fees and uh, calculation is occurs from when you prepay to uh, that open period that reduces your cost. Uh, there's always going to be a defeasance fee. Uh, try to negotiate that the best you can. Not all, all borrowers are the same. Uh, some, some lenders will have more flexibility depending on the borrower and the property type. Um, but you know, usually that's like a half percent. They'll have a low end of maybe 10 grand and high end of $20,000. Um, as far as the cost, uh, the lender's attorney's fees, uh, account fees, uh, I really haven't seen a cap on that. You, know, you may get a reasonable uh, qualifier in there, but it's, it's a hidden cost. They have to incur it. Um, so that's really it with the fees. And now on yield maintenance, uh, it's easier. You don't have all those hidden costs at the back end, but you typically uh, have to pay for yield maintenance up front, uh, unless you have it. Banks put it on their books. It's not a course loan. Usually, you get your payments up front on an additional fee. Uh, that's very simple. Uh, it's a present value calculation. But again, if you have an open period at the end, you want to make sure that that's calculated to the open period. So it saves you about three months of uh, payments at the end. Um, and with uh, let me go back and defeat with your collateral too. Uh, a lot of times, the loan documents you get them will just say the collateral is with U.S. Treasuries. You want to try to get expand. Governmental securities, it just opens the pool to the type of collateral that you can um, So that's yield maintenance, that's defeasance. Uh, you want to negotiate those sort of points up front. Uh, depending on the length of the loan term, uh, you get all that cross collateralization. Uh, do the partial defeasance. If you have more than one property that's pooled together, they will permit you to do a partial defeasance to get a partial release, but typically you have to pay a little bit more than your allocated loan amount uh, for, for that property. And that varies, but it's usually around 115, 120% of whatever the allocated loan amount is. Um, another possible exit strategy is to use the assumption of provisions on a long-term loan. Um, you know, if you're going to be in a rate of, or environment of raise, or rising interest rates, uh, when you go and you get your loan to low-term interest rate, you know, five years from now, interest rates may be a couple points higher. Uh, you know, that's more value that you're putting into the property that we can present that to you, uh, prospective buyer. That's very helpful, because especially if you are, even during the internal transfer within the, within the partnerships, that, which is very common in our community. Yeah. And so... Yeah, so the internal transfer. So, you, yes, and you want to make sure when, you know, I think I touched on this a little bit up front or before, uh, your transfer provisions and your loan documents, I don't want to make sure that those are sort of crafted to whatever your needs are going to be. There's going to be restrictions. You're not going to have to uh, be able to give up control without having to pay some sort of fee. But, uh, you know, if you have a 20% part of the partner that wants to get out, you should be able to uh, negotiate that up front without any uh, uh, consent of the lender to occur without any payment of a uh, fee. You may have to cover some costs. But, uh, yes. That should be negotiated. I think the, the, your original question on, on ownership and uh, and promote structures is something that's a little more concrete um, that I think we should discuss in case we are actually uh, talking about alternative structures. So, for example, you can go to a uh, crowdfunding source like Realty Mogul or something like that. I've had a I worked with a group of guys who took a Holiday Inn in uh, they haven't finished. <laughs> We invented crowdfunding. Right. <laughs> it took a holiday in in uh, in um, 
outside of Kansas City to do a double chicken conversion. Now these guys didn't have the money to do it themselves. So you have to ask yourself, sure, you want the real estate. We all want the real estate. But let's just take a hypothetical $20 million project. You need uh, 40% um, equity, let's say, to be conservative. And so you need $8 million bucks. So you need $8 million and you don't have $8 million. And you love the project. So what do you do? You can go to a realty mogul. You can go to an a institutional partner who's going to work with you on a developer promote structure. So you will need to come up with 10% of that equity. So you need to come up with $800,000. And they'll come up with the other $7.2 million. What you're paying on that $7.2 million is the first 18% uh, returns prep are paid to them. But if you know that you can turn this holiday in around, make it a double tree, and sell it for two times the price you bought it, four plus, or 1.5 times the price you bought it for $30 million, um, Pick some tough numbers there to do right here, but uh, but um, you get the point that you can make your eight hundred thousand. So after eighteen percent, you make you keep ninety percent of the profit. So if you think you can make forty percent rate of return leveraged, then why wouldn't you just take your eight hundred thousand dollars and make one two point four million dollars off it, and then do that two more times, and next time you do the whole hotel yourself. That's the point. It is a luxury to think that we'll always have all the equity we want for the projects, unless we're just gonna build small projects. But the day you wanna start going to these double digit, larger uh, hotels and you know mixed use projects, things like that, which I implore you to do, then you're gonna have to start thinking about uh, being a little more creative with your equity stack, um, with MEZ, with selling prep equity, and stuff like that. But I think we've graduated to the point where this or we can do that um, and, and not just be stuck, you know, doing um, smaller projects in volume. I agree with you on that. It's actually, it's not just about thinking about cash flow today. It's thinking about the residual that you're going to make. Yeah, it, it, it's thinking about the return on your cash. And that's all that matters. It doesn't really matter what the actual volume of that cash is at the end. And I, go, go, I would add, I'm, I'm all about yeah. I'm, I'm all about yield uh, over money, right? So uh, uh, with EV5, uh, we actually only give the investors because there's two primary focus for EV5. Uh, number one is uh, getting them the green cards. Number two is getting them the money back. Um, so that way, uh, we actually give uh, our investors a very low return. And as a regional center, we charge the developer the arbitrage. So it might be seven percent, and we take. Our, our fees are the ones in the middle between the one and one and a half percent that we give to the investors. We ran into this accidentally because we were trying to build a hotel. So we went out to one of our guys because we've got to find some way to find some <laughs> debt or some source of capital and we ran into EB5 and now we've made it a big business out of it. It's very complicated um, and, uh, but uh, we've, been, we've been blessed with good partners and good infrastructure that we built over the last seven years. And again, this is projects not limited to the Hudson Yards or right. Century Plaza. It's downtown Phoenix. Yes, downtown Phoenix. Uh, we are uh, should be opening up soon. Uh, hopefully, this week. Missed the whole NCAA tournament. Um, uh, our Marriott Courtyard residence in. Um, but our most exciting project, actually, we're building a museum for the law enforcement on a $130 million uh, museum, we're at $25 million capital stack, and we raised all this money, 90% of it came from China. That's uh, kind of weird, right? Um, the Chinese funding our law enforcement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, just to say that the, this isn't an option available to everybody, but the past 30 years uh, or so of this community building a reputation of being really, really great at building, acquiring, operating, owning, and making profit from hotels is why you're now at the point where you get to actually live the American dream, which is to spend other people's money to do the things you want to do. Because you get to trade on that reputation now. Just going back on your EB5, um, you said that because we have a new regime. A new regime, that's good. Political <laughs> system, um, SEC, you know, regulations are changing, immigration uh, regulation is changing as well. Just any thoughts on 
Well, on April 28th, uh, it's part of the, we were, EB-5 was a, supposed to sunset last year, and it, it just got, I call it kicking the bucket uh, with the, the continued resolution. But it's up on April 28th. Uh, we see EB-5 changing very significant. I think the minimum raise, um, right now it's $500,000 in TEA markets. Um, it's probably gonna go up between 850,000 to $1.3 million. Um, so it'll, be, it'll become a little bit more challenging, but it's easier. The guys that are investing in, my, in the EB-5 program, uh, they're leaving their country because for a reason. Um, and they, they, it doesn't matter if it's $1.3 million or $500,000, they are still going to invest because, uh, you know, to them, this is the security in real estate and their security in the United States. Just to add on to the uh, new political environment that we're in, how do you all see the evolution of Dodd-Frank? How is that going to open up lending to our community if there is a change in uh, relaxation and regulation? And predictions. How many more hikes do you see before the end of the year? In terms of that? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I'm at least two for this year. Okay. At least two. Um, probably, you know, right around 0.25%, um, but the, the definitely a minimum of two, and I, it, it's all gonna depend on how the economy progresses here in the next uh, two years. What is our political climate? Yeah, I take the over on two, um, and that doesn't mean that it's gonna have a massive effect downstream. Uh, if they're two quarter point rates, it's, it's not gonna have, and you're still seeing a growing economy, so. Whatever your NOI is rising is going to get eaten up by that slightly higher interest cost, perhaps. Uh, with Dodd Frank, I don't think that uh, these guys are going to get that much done. I don't think that there is much to be done. Um, that's going. To, I think it's been a red herring or a scapegoat that regional banks have been hampered by Dodd Frank, and that's why you haven't been able to get lending. I actually think it's simply because they got burned uh, really bad by this industry and all real estate uh, from 2008 to 2011, and this is just a good scapegoat. Um, so what uh, loosening of lending requirements will there be that's going to make a bank all of a sudden say, oh yeah, let me take a risk on this $30 million hotel project that's five-story wood construction. You know what I mean? Like it's not going to be some rapid shift in being like, oh yeah, thank God, there's not one more box to check. So um, I don't think you're going to see that massive of a change uh, with that. Uh, with Do regard you see the change in the underwriting process? Again, I... In terms of the liquidity, your balance sheet. Uh, so how many times, Vina, do you think that a bank tells you that it's because of the government that um, we don't believe you have enough liquidity or else we'd lend to you, versus the bank itself thinking that it's you don't... It's that the regional bank can't take it out to the secondary market to sell, so they can't yeah. take it on their balance sheet and then sell. So, I mean, I, I, I think that um, to the extent the changes will be made in that bank, and there will, uh, and there'll be administratively changes made, whether or not there is some sort of uh, light repeal. Um, I, I still don't think that that's going to come downstream in a meaningful way uh, in the short or medium term at all, especially as we just said, we're also now they're gonna hit a cyclical problem. Um, if you're talking about new construction uh, and regional financing, you're gonna hit the problem of everyone knows that uh, the next couple of years will have a slowdown. Uh, a bit as well. So, um, you know, I just keep my eyes and ears open. I think the other thing that you can also remember is not underestimate downside risk. So, that things can get better, but then things can get really bad fast as well. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, change to Dodd-Frank is inevitable, some change, but the downstream effect is going to be, in, in my mind, very limited. I mean, these banks are there's a lot of burn, afterburn from 2008, and I don't think that that's going to change in terms of their underwriting. Um, you're right on the packages and reselling, there's, there might be some impact, but I don't think there's going to be that much of an impact in terms of your relationship with the banks and how they evaluate your asset that they're trying to finance. In terms of interest rate hikes, I mean, yeah, I agree with you guys too. Um, you saw the last one, they, they, they hiked it, but the treasuries actually rallied, so it was already kind of priced in. So, downstream effect, short term, I don't know if there's going to be that much. Um, I agree with sort of the, just the NOI increase, we're just getting away by that, but um, we're going to see increasing interest rates. We've lived in a period of time where we've been very fortunate 
And if you can refinance debt and get good terms, I would encourage you to do so um, because they are going to continue to go up, um, whether or not this year or next year. But there's going to be two hikes, in my opinion, if I was a betting man. Yeah, with Don Frank, um, I, again, I'm just piggybacking on what everyone else said here. It really is it's going to depend on what changes are made. I, I will say, though, uh, the one benefit I, I think you may see from a lending standpoint is uh, there has been a sort of a consolidation of the smaller banks in the market. This is the market we're in uh, as a result of the uh, increased cost, really, to comply with regulations. So you may see some smaller banks, if those regulations are lightened, you may see some more smaller banks uh, come into play in your areas. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're not going to be financing your $30 million in hotel acquisition. Uh, and as far as the, the CMBS market, uh, we're talking about uh, selling it to investors. I, I don't think that's going away. I think they're always going to have some sort of risk reduction requirements. So I, I, I don't think you're going to spoil them. Last question before Q and A. If two hikes, is it going to pass? Yeah, sorry. Um, last question, Donna. Two hikes. So Sagar answered, you would refine now. Dan. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, the reason I don't answer, I know where this is all going to go. Like refinance and get your cash out and you can go build another hotel or buy another hotel. I come from Phoenix, Arizona. We were hit so hard um, that personally I'm not a believer in refinancing for new acquisition and refinancing for, um, I'm, I'm the existing cash flow and then invest that either into the property or into a new property. I'm very, I'm very concerned <laughs> by nature. Uh, I've seen people lose hotels uh, families destroyed by exactly, th that's what they were doing, they were refinancing, buying another hotel, refinancing, buying another hotel, building another hotel, and they got, they've gone, They're, they have disappeared, and, and, and be cautious about that. But I'm always going to come from the conservative side of this. Refinance or? Hold on, Tony. Uh, refinance. <laughs> <laughs> Um, responsibly refinance and uh, when you refinance in order to have the happy medium between the two of us put some put some cash away uh, don't just refinance and take it all and go and acquire a bunch of assets just have a rainy day fund just like you would anywhere else that's one lesson you should learn that's the same thing that Dodd Frank requires this mark to market is and, and so do it um, same right now, if, if you have offers on, on assets that are coming up on PIP and everything, and you know that's coming, and someone's willing to buy it, sell it, and take the cash, um, and, and wait for that downturn, wait for some new acquisitions, you know, otherwise you're just operating hotels, and you're not a REIT. Um, and, and, you know, so I think that there's a lot of opportunity right now to cycle cash. When you make money in real estate, either by hitting the right timing, by hitting the right financing, or by hit adding value to the physical plan of an asset. Um, this is a timing game now, and you will have a bunch of opportunities to add values to assets in the next two years, um, and then the financing game again. Yeah, I do want to add, refinance responsibility is key. Um, don't lever up to 80% um, and, and take that risk, especially with the cyclical nature of our business. Um, but hold, I mean, if you can refinance responsibility, hold on cash, there will be buying opportunity in the next couple of years. Um, I mean, with interest rates going up, valuations are going to come down, uh, the market will soften. I mean, there will be opportunities. So I think of it long term, right? I, I think that that's kind of important here. So that's my comment on that. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, so my name is Rahul Patel. I provide financing as well. The question that you asked is good about uh, where interest rates are going to go over the next few weeks or a few months. But the peak for prime rate was eight and a quarter. So if you're thinking about the next two hype rates, what you should be thinking about is where is that peak going to be for primary? A lot of people here might be in seven, eight financing. You don't want to be there whenever you get to eight and a quarter prime or maybe even higher, who knows? Um, so, but I agree with them. Don't let her up. Just reconnect to your right now. Um, but that eight and a quarter, I mean, that's where 
That's where it is today, or that's where it's uh, potentially headed. more creative um, capital stack that includes uh, municipal buy-in, state buy-in, energy efficiency, everything you can do to make your um, actual underwriting look that much more attractive. property, make it attractive where you're using the community. Uh, we've got right now Hilton Garden Inn that's going to start construction where uh, the developer donated uh, one and a half acres for a dog park in front of his hotel. Right? That was thinking outside the box because the infrastructure cost was going to be over a million dollars. Um, and, and they gave him the money to do it. So always think outside the box. And then there's a lot of experts. You guys are here at AHOA and I've always been the guy that says network, 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 talk, talk, talk. Tell them about your project and uh, make this a successful conference. I agree. Get your community involved. I agree with, um, <coughs> I don't want to call you Dinesh, sorry, I apologize. Uh, and Siraj about um, incentives and changing the capital stack. Um, one of the projects I remember my parents working on, we actually got historical tax credits for redoing the facade of a historic hotel which was worth a ton of money and actually reduced our capital contribution to the deal. So sometimes actually knocking on the mayor's door, you know, going to the planning office actually helps and reduce your, your basis and can help you. They're there to help you. They want the tax dollars in, your commu in their community. So there are ways to be creative. Um, it's not just knocking on the banks as well. There's money out there. And I think there are incentives now for energy efficiency as you said, but I think they're in the cities. I see them in New York, they bring lead buildings and so forth, but there's money. That's what we're here, let's talk money. <laughs> Again, that last, last thought, I guess. Um, remember, this is a relationship business. I mean, your lenders, it's, you, you gotta make sure that you think long-term with that. I mean, regional lenders are one thing, but when you grow, commercial lenders, bringing them into the fold, life companies, any other sources of financing, I mean, the relationship will really go all the way, I think. And like Dan said, Use this network. I mean, uh, there's a lot of best practices that we can share with one another, and we didn't get here without some help. So just remember that and, and, and leverage each other. Thank you. <laughs>